Describe to us how white oak pastures is different than a monocrop agriculture farm or a farm raising cattle in a, in a, in a specific, in a, a farm raising cattle in like a factory farm way. How do you guys do this differently? What's going on there that's so different? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that, but also let me tell you that, uh, you know, it, it's, you can see in, the, in that, in that video, the, the soil, the, the erosion is happening. What you can't see is there's copious quantities of pesticides and chemical fertilizer in that land that's not coming off of our land. But we don't use pesticide and chemical fertilizer. So that's uh, it's kind of a, the, the untold part of it that, that still exists. So uh, <clears throat> we, we manage this farm uh, holistically. And to us, that means in restarting the cycles of nature. Industrial monocrop far, uh, farming uh, breaks the cycles of nature. It, it misuses technology to break the cycles of nature. It's interesting to me that, that no creature on earth has ever been able to break the cycles of nature. But we humans, as puny as we are, have mastered technology to the, to the point that we can literally break these cycles. And the cycles of nature. <clears throat> to me, are the water cycle, the energy cycle, the water cycle, the microbial cycle, the uh, grazing cycle, carbon cycle, on and on, many cycles that are going on all the time in a, in a natural environment. And those cycles of nature, when they're operating optimally, create an abundance. <clears throat> and the abundance is what we're supposed to be living off of. But the use of, of, of technology has allowed us to cheat the system so that we can get a greater abundance in the short run, but it comes with incredible unintended consequences. And those unintended consequences are unnoticed for a long time, and they're almost always undesirable. And in this case, they fall on the backs of the animals and the environment in the economy of rural America. And so I remember driving around White Oak one time with you in a Jeep and you were telling me the story of how it all got started. I mean, this is an interesting story that I'd love for you to share with people because when your dad, White Oak, you told me that White Oak's been in your family for what, six generations, 125 years. Yeah. When your dad farmed this land, he didn't do it the way you do it. So what happened, and, and how is it different now? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that, to me, that's one of the, the parts of the farm story I enjoy most. So my, my great-grandfather came here in 1866 and ran the farm, followed by his son, my grandfather, who ran the farm. And those guys in the uh, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, would have farmed in a way that was very focused on the benefit of the animals and the land and the local community. Not, not, not out of any altruistic nobility. It's just that the land was their wealth and the animals were their income stream and the local market was the only down market they could get to. So there was that, that system necessitated uh, doing the right things by the land, the animals, and the community. My dad was born in 1920. He was a third generation and, uh, to run the farm. And he uh, took over the farm post-World War II. And World War II was the game changer. That's when all the technology that uh, had spun off the war effort was made available to farmers. Things like ammoniated fertilizer, pesticides. <clears throat> that was a game changer. And there was the need for cheap, abundant food. Europe was starving, and, uh, and the industrialization of agriculture, moving to monocultures, <clears throat> made food obscenely cheap and wastefully abundant, and uh, probably not as nutritious as it should have been. Paul, that gets over into your, you know, what, what you uh, have expertise in. 
<clears throat> and it impoverished the rural community. That, that commoditization and centralization rendered the economy of rural America to be economically irrelevant, just wasn't needed anymore, and it became impoverished. So my dad farmed the farm that way and was very successful. He, he, was, um, he did very well with it uh, <clears throat> for his lifetime. I took over the farm. I graduated from the University of Georgia College of Agriculture in 1976. And I farmed is it, uh, probably more industrially than my dad did. I torqued it up to another level and farmed that way for 20 years. And then I started to view things differently and started changing the way I farm. And then for the last 25 years, we've been moving into this, what I call kinder, gentler, uh, agriculture, food production. <clears throat> Two of my daughters, who are now the fifth generation, came back with their spouses. And between them, they've got five, five grandchildren who are the sixth generation on the farm. So that's the <clears throat> evolution. And so what, what was it like when you took it over? Because I've heard you tell some pretty crazy stories about what, how the cattle were raised and what they were fed. And these, I think we could get more into this, this nitrate fertilizer and where that came from. And then what does it look like now? I think a lot of people have never been to a regenerative farm. They haven't seen white oak and they don't understand how you, you do things differently now. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> it would be the focus of the industrialized monocultural factory farm is efficiency and taking cost out of production and that's done most commonly by scaling up. And it's incredible the amount of efficiencies and cost containment you can do if that's your only focus. If nothing matters other than increasing efficiency, you can just really, uh, really torque that up. But it comes with, it comes at the expense of resilience. I think of resilience and efficiency as being yin and yang. And You've got to have some of both. It can't be all about one or the other. By the way, resilience to me is the ability of a system, in this case my farm, to handle adversity and continue to go on. And we, we endeavor to be as resilient as we possibly can. Um, so... Uh, you know, I operated that way for a long time. You ask about specifics. I guess one of the most poignant specific is that uh, <clears throat> somebody somewhere discovered, a land grant university somewhere discovered that you could feed chicken shit to cattle and they would gain weight on it. You know, it's incredibly cheap. This is chicken manure from big, big industrial operations, which would not just be pure chicken manure. It would have a lot of <clears throat> chemicals and things in it that are even more undesirable probably than the manure itself. But mixed properly with corn or something that's highly palatable and enough antibiotics to keep the animals from getting sick on it, you can very cost-effectively make animals gain weight in cattle, gain weight in confinement by feeding it. It's a very unnatural feed food stuff, and there's a lot wrong with it. But but how to do it is literally was, I guess still is, literally taught in land grant universities. That's where I got it from. So things like that were uh, pretty normal confinement feeding, uh, monocultural uh, operations, uh, you know, no no symbiosis, no uh, one plus one equal three that you get in nature, the abundance. So it, it's uh it's a, it's a, you can really produce a cheap crop if that's all you care about. And so how does it look now? What do the cows on white oak pastures eat now? And, and how is it different? <clears throat> well, I'm probably a little, uh, not, very, not, not very objective, but I, I mean, I think it's beautiful. You know, it's, it's uh, <clears throat> a lot of different, plants and animals and microbes living in symbiotic relationships with each other, kind of a, a Jurassic Park kind of a deal. 
you know, to me, it's like the Garden of Eden. Uh, but it's uh, it looks a lot different from, from it than it did then. Because you saw the soil, how different it looks. Uh, and whereas I had a monoculture that only cattle fed in confinement where they could not express instinctive behavior. They were just pinned up there to eat. Uh, they're loose on the pastures. This farm is 3,200 acres. It's divided up into about 150, 30-ish acre paddocks. And we move the animals in the grazing season every single day, the cattle every single day. Uh, we also raise uh, hogs, goats, sheep, rabbits, and five species of poultry. Again, animal movement is uh, essential, an essential part of the program and all of it. You know, animals are not meant to sit in one place. And we say that the hogs are meant to root and wall, the cows are meant to roam and graze, chickens are meant to scratch and peck, <clears throat> and not allowing them to express that instinctive behavior is a form of animal cruelty. So that's part of what we do. So you're letting them move around. I mean, I've been on the farm and I've seen the movement. It's actually pretty cool. It's very humbling to, to be, I don't know how many cattle were there when we moved, maybe a, a thousand, a couple hundred at least. Day. You know, that, that day, I, I remember uh, the last time you were here, we moved our biggest herd, which is about a thousand mama cows. <clears throat> and most of them had calved by the time we, when you were here. So that was probably 700 or so calves. So 1,700 animals, a million, two million pounds of beef, and it, it, it go, they go through a 16-foot gate in about eight minutes. And, and they're not being pushed, they're being pulled. You know, they, they, they're moved every day, so they're like Pavlov's dog. When they see us coming, they start salivating, and they're standing there at the gate. And uh, people ask how we push them through, and I say, you know, you, you need to get your ass out of the way. It's what you got to do. <laughs> and they they ran through that gate, um, and, and they went into this big field. I guess another thirty acre paddock with right, right. with grass that was green and, and and long. And so, and then after they spread out, I remember walking amongst them. We were taking photos and looking around. But these cows were happy, and there were birds flying around and bugs. And it was this really interesting, idyllic scene where. These cows had been on one pasture where there were some trees and they moved to another one and they were just happy as, as clams, you know, to mix my metaphors, you know, and they get to this new patch of land and they get this new fresh grass and they spread out and they just go about eating and they just look like happy, healthy animals. And like you described, there's other species interacting with them in that bigger space. And it's really pretty, pretty beautiful. Well, I mean, you just touched on how that improvement in the soil is made when you said they, they're, they're, uh, and they're moved, they, we, we can find them uh, to really impact that grass. We want them to give it, give it, turn, be turned on to big, sweet, pretty grass. And we want them to really hammer it, eat it down where it's short. <clears throat> and of course, they're, uh, while they're doing that, they're urinating, they're defecating, those cloven hooves are breaking up the soil cap. And then we, when we move them to the next uh, paddock, we call it, which is every day, that, that we won't be back to that for about 45 days to give it time to recover. And that's how that soil changed so, so abruptly. It's just like, you know, those, and this is, this is part of the climate change, uh, climate impact side of it. You know, those plants are photosynthesizing. That's the energy cycle. They're, they're breathing in greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and, and, and whatever else, pulling it out of the atmosphere, turning it into fat and protein and carbohydrate. That is the plant tissue. Some of it's above the ground, where the cows can eat it or the animals can eat it. Some of it's below the ground in the form of roots. And it's part of nature, part of the design of things for ruminants to come through and harvest off that grass on top so that photosynthesis can begin. And when they do, it starts to slough some of the roots off from the bottom. And that carbon that was in those roots is marooned down there for some period of time. 
and then the you know, plants on the other side grow again. So the plant is literally like a pump, pulling greenhouse gases down, putting it in the soil. In addition to that, the plant, when it's growing and photosynthesizing, taking those greenhouse gases and turning it into carbohydrates, sucrose, sugar, is pumping it into the roots. And those roots leak. We didn't know about that 15 years ago. But in those roots intentionally leak, and that sucrose feeds microbes in the soil. And those microbes in the soil <clears throat> consume that sugar and exchange it chemically for minerals. You know, those, those microbes in the soil, there's no energy down there. That comes from the sun. But there's minerals. Those plants need minerals. They got energy because they, they can create or they can transform it from radiation to chemical. So it's just a beautiful symbiotic system that's working. And that's why, to those of us who understand it, when we hear the junk science of cattle are destroying the, the, the climate, it is just so junk science. Now, cattle that aren't raised in that environment where that, that, that symbiosis is going on, yeah. They're contributing to climate change. We're in full agreement. But not cattle that are raised in accordance with the way the natural system is supposed to work. 